Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Tammy Nguyen. I'm 12 years old and I attend sixth grade at Dill Middle School here in the district. Today, I'd like to say something about change and the way it happens. As you can see, a lot has changed for me. I've moved on from Bancroft Elementary to a new middle school where I'm at the bottom, not the top of the grades. I have new teachers, friends, classes, and assignments. I couldn't really do much about this kind of change. It just happens to you as you get older. <laughs> but another big change in my life since last year has come because of a partnership my classmates and I at Bancroft Elementary had with Mrs. Obama and the White House. My fifth grade class was invited to help dig, plant, harvest, cook, and eat vegetables from the White House kitchen garden. We picked the peas right off the vines and popped almost as many in our mouths as we put in the bowls. <laughs> we discovered how delicious vegetables can be and we started to notice that colorful world Chef Sam introduced us to at harvest time. At school, we, research, we researched vegetables, where they came from, where they traveled to, and their many varieties. We care for them in our own school garden and we're proud to show them when Mrs. Obama came and even helped us plant seedlings from her house down 16th Street. <laughs> from these experiences, my friends and I have learned a lot about change, about eating healthy foods and making the right choices. We've learned skills that will last a lifetime and our lives will last a lot longer. As for change, sometimes it doesn't happen, and I'm kind of glad about that. My fifth grade classmates and I plan to keep that color on the plate, and I don't mean M&Ms. <laughs> I am really glad that Mrs. Obama is interested in continuing to teach kids about eating healthy and making good food choices. Another, another thing that has not changed is what I said to Mrs. Obama when she visited my school last year. Mrs. Obama, you are an inspiration to us. Thank you for motivating us and including us in this exciting garden project. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an incredible honor for me to introduce someone who has done and been so much for me, my friends, my school, and my family, the First Lady of the United States, Mrs. Michelle Obama. Thank you so much. It is uh, a thrill to have you all here in my home, and I want to thank Tammy. Oh, I could just start crying. You're so sweet and so smart, and you've gotten so tall. You're on your game, girl. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and for all your outstanding work. I mean, it's important, Tammy, for you to know how much you and your classmates have all played a role in where we are today. Look at this room. Look at all these important people with cameras and lights. And it's because of what you helped me start at the White House Garden. So I am so proud of you all. And I hope you're doing well in sixth grade. I know it gets harder, homework's tougher, but you know, you can do it. Uh, I want to also recognize the cabinet members here, some of my good friends and partners in crime, Secretaries Vilsack, Sebelius, uh, Duncan, Salazar, Donovan, did I leave anybody? Solis, it's you. Uh, as well as Surgeon General uh, Benjamin, who has just been a tremendous uh, support in this. I want to thank them all for their excellent work, their leadership. You all are doing a phenomenal job. And again, we wouldn't be able to do this without you. I also want to thank some of our other guests, Senators Harkin and uh, Gillenbrand. It's good to see you all. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, Representatives uh, DeLauro, uh, Christensen, and Fudge, uh, thank you for being here and the work that you have done uh, to get us to this point. Uh, I want to thank Tiki, good MC, pretty sharp, good on your feet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's still upset because he's shorter than me. It's okay, Tiki. <laughs> 
That was the first thing he said. He was visibly, he's like, I didn't know you were so tall. I was like, yeah, I know, I know. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for your work, your passion. Uh, thank you for braving the weather to be here. Uh, we're glad to have you on board. Uh, Dr. Judith Palfrey, uh, thank you for your wonderful work as well as Will Allen. Uh, wonderful words, uh, and we're going to get on it. Uh, Mayors Johnston and Curta Tony, you guys are doing a terrific job and you represent all of what we can do together. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, and thank you all for uh, coming today uh, and, and braving this weather uh, and risking getting stuck here. Uh, uh, thank you for the work that you do every day to help our kids lead active and healthy lives. Uh, and one final congratulations is in order. I hear that. Uh, uh, the Watkins Hornets, are some of the Hornets here? Yeah. All right, stand up, because I know you're bored. <laughs> they're, just, they're just barely hanging in. But we want you here, because this is really about all of you. We've got other kids, but these guys. Uh, are the national football champions, right? <laughs> Congratulations, you guys. You guys can sit. We're almost done. Hang in there. Just think you could be in school. <laughs> but we're, we're, we're all here today because we care deeply about the health and well-being of not just these kids up here, but uh, for all kids like them all across the country. Uh, and clearly we're determined to finally take on one of the most serious threats to their future. Uh, and that's the epidemic of childhood obesity in America today. And obviously it's an issue uh, of great concern to me, not just as a first lady, but as a mother. And as Tiki said, often when we talk about this issue, we begin by citing sobering statistics like the ones we've heard today. Um, and we, we can't say it enough because we have to drill this in, uh, that over the past three decades, childhood obesity rates in this country have tripled, uh, that nearly one-third of children in America are now overweight or obese. That's one in three of our children. But the truth is that these numbers don't paint the full picture. And it's important to say this. Um, the words overweight and obese, they, those words don't tell the full story. Because this isn't about inches and pounds. And it's not about how our kids look. It has nothing to do with that. It's about how our kids feel. And it's about how they feel about themselves. It's about the impact that we're seeing that this issue is having on every aspect of their lives. Pediatricians like Dr. Palfrey all over this country are seeing kids with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, more and more kids with type 2 diabetes, and as we all know, that used to only be a disease of adults. Our teachers, talking a lot of them, they are telling me how they're seeing the bullying, the teasing. Our school counselors see the depression and the low self-esteem. Coaches are seeing kids struggling to keep up or worse yet, sitting on the sidelines, unable to engage. Our military leaders report that obesity is now one of the most common disqualifiers for military service. Economic experts tell us that we are spending outrageous amounts of money uh, treating obesity-related conditions like diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. And then public health experts, as Tiki said, tell us that the current generation is actually on track to having a shorter lifespan to, than their parents. And none of us wants this future for our kids, and none of us wants this future for our country. So instead of just talking about this problem and worrying and wringing our hands, it's time for us to get going and do something about this. We have to act. So let's move. Let's get this done. Let's move to get families and communities together to make healthy decisions for their kids. Let's move to bring together our governors and our mayors, doctors and nurses, businesses, community groups, educators, athletes, moms, dads, you name it, together to tackle the challenge once and for all. And that's why we're here today, to launch this wonderful new campaign called Let's Move. Let's hear it. Let's move. <laughs> Let's
Let's Move is a campaign that's going to rally our nation to achieve a single but very ambitious goal, and that's to solve the problem of childhood obesity in a generation so that children born today will reach adulthood at a healthy weight. But to get where we want to go, it's important for us to first understand how we got here. So I'm going to ask all the grown-ups in the room to just close your eyes for a moment and think back. Think back to the time when we were all kids, as Tiki did. He's there, causing trouble. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like many of you, when I was young, uh, we walked to school every day, rain or shine. And in Chicago, it was in the wind, sleet, snow, and hail. We were out there. You remember how uh, at school we had to have recess? Had to have it. You had to have gym. We spent hours running around outside when school got out. You couldn't even go inside until it was time to dinner, for dinner. And then in so many households, we'd gather around the table for dinner as a family. And in my household, in many, there was one simple rule. You ate what was on your plate, <laughs> good, bad, or ugly. <laughs> Kids had absolutely no say in what they felt like eating. If you didn't like it, you were welcome to go to bed hungry. And back then, fast food was a treat. It was something that happened occasionally. It was a big treat for us. Uh, and dessert was mainly a Sunday affair. And in my home, we weren't rich. Uh, the foods weren't fancy, but there was always a vegetable on the plate. And we managed to lead pretty healthy lives. But many kids today aren't so fortunate. Uh, urban sprawl and fears about safety often mean the only walking our kids do is out the front door to a bus or a car. And then cuts and recess and gym mean a lot less running around for our kids during the day, school day. And lunchtime may mean a school lunch heavy on calories and fat. And for many kids, those afternoons spent riding bikes and playing ball until dusk have been replaced by afternoons inside with the TV on and internet, video games. And these days, with parents working so hard, longer hours, some cases two jobs, they just don't have the time for those family dinners. And with the price of fruits and vegetables rising 50% higher than overall food costs over the past two decades, a lot of times they don't have the money or they don't have a supermarket in their community. So their best option for dinner is something from the shelf of, of the local convenience store or gas station. So this is where we are. Many parents desperately want to do the right thing, but they feel like the deck is stacked against them. They know their kid's health is their responsibility, but they feel like it's completely out of their control. And they're bombarded by contradictory information at every turn. They don't know what to believe or who to believe. And this leads to a lot of guilt and anxiety and a sense that no matter what they do, it's not going to be right and it's not going to be enough. And I know what that feels like because I've been there. Look, I live in a wonderful house and today I am blessed with more help and support than I could have ever imagined. But I didn't always live in the White House. Uh, and it wasn't that long ago that I was a working mom, I've shared this story, struggling to balance meetings and deadlines and soccer and ballet, and there were plenty of nights when you got home so tired and hungry, and you just wanted to get through the drive through because it was quick and it was cheap. Or there were the times you threw in that less healthy microwave option because it was easy. And one day my pediatrician, thankfully, was someone who was already doing what the American Academy is going to do, pulled me aside and told me, you might want to think about doing things a little bit differently. And for me, that was my moment of truth. It was a wake-up call that I was, in fact, the one in charge, even if it didn't always feel that way. And today, it's time for a moment of truth for our nation. It's time for a wake-up call for all of us. It's, it's time for us to be really honest with ourselves about how we got here. Because the truth is, our kids didn't do this to themselves. Our kids don't decide what's served to them at school or whether there's time for gym or recess. Our kids don't choose to make food products with tons of sugar and sodium and supersized portions and then to have those products marketed to them everywhere they turn. And no matter how much they beg for pizza, fries, and candy, ultimately, they are not and should not be the ones calling the shots at dinner time. 
we're in charge. We make these decisions. But fortunately, that's the good news here. Because if we're the ones that make the decisions, then we can decide to solve this problem. And when I say we, I'm not just talking about folks in Washington. This is not about politics. There is nothing Democratic or Republican, liberal or conservative about doing what's best for our kids. And I haven't spoken to one expert about this issue uh, who has said that the solution is having government tell people what to do. Instead, I'm talking about what we all can do. I'm talking about common sense steps we can take in our families and communities to help our kids lead active, healthy lives. And this isn't about turning the clock back to when we were kids or preparing five course meals from scratch every night. No one has the time for that. And it is not about being 100% perfect 100% of the time because Lord knows I'm not. Uh, there is a place in this life for cookies and ice cream and burgers and fries. That is a part of the fun of childhood. Often it's just about balance. It's about really small changes that can add up, like walking to school when you can, replacing soda with water or skim milk, trimming portion sizes just a little. Things like this can mean the difference between being healthy and fit or not. And there's no one-size-fits-all solution here. Instead, it's about families making manageable changes that fit with their schedules and their budgets and their needs and tastes and their realities. And it's about communities working to support these efforts. Mayors like Mayors Johnston and Curta Tony, who are building sidewalks and parks and community gardens. It's, it's about athletes like, and role models like Tiki, who are building playgrounds to help kids stay active community leaders like Will Allen, who are bringing farmers markets to underserved areas, and companies like the food industry leaders who came together last fall and acknowledged their responsibility to be part of the solution. But there is so much more that we have to do. And that's really the mission of Let's Move, to create this wave of efforts across the country that get us to our goal of solving childhood obesity in a generation. And we kicked off this initiative this morning in my husband's office when he signed a presidential mem memorandum establishing the first ever government-wide task force on childhood obesity. And the task force is going to be comprised of representatives from key agencies. Many of them are here today. And over the next 90 days, yes, more work for you, uh, <laughs> these folks will review every program and policy relating to child nutrition and physical activity. They're going to develop an action plan to marshal these resources to meet our goal. And to ensure we're continuously on track to meet those goals, the task force is going to set some real concrete benchmarks to measure our progress. But we can't wait 90 days to get going here, and we won't. So let's move right now, starting today, on a series of initiatives to help achieve our goal. First. Let's move to offer parents the tools and information they need and they've been asking for to make healthy choices for their kids. We've been working with the FDA and several manufacturers and retailers to make our food labels more customer friendly so people don't have to spend hours squinting at the words they can't pronounce to figure out whether the food they're buying is healthy or not. In fact, just today, the nation's largest beverage companies announced that they'll be taking steps to provide clear, visible information about calories on the front of their products, as well as on vending machines and soda fountains. And this is exactly the kind of vital information parents need to make good choices for their kids. We're also working with the American Academy of Pediatrics and supporting their groundbreaking efforts uh, to ensure that doctors not only regularly measure children's BMI, but actually write that prescription detailing real steps that parents can take to get their kids healthy and fit. In addition, we're going to be working with the Walt Disney Company, NBC Universal, and Viacom to launch a nationwide public awareness campaign educating parents and children about how to fight childhood obesity. And we're creating a one-stop shopping website, letsmove.gov, good name. So with the click of a mouse, parents can find helpful tips and step-by-step -step strategies, including healthy recipes, exercise plans, and charts that they can use to keep their family's progress on track. But let's remember that 31 million American children participate in the federal school meals program. And many of these kids consume as many as half of their calories daily uh, at school. 
And what we don't want is the situation where parents are taking all the right steps at home and then their kids undo all that work when they go to school with salty, fatty foods in the school cafeteria. So let's move to get healthier food into our nation's schools. That's the second part of this initiative. We'll start by updating and strengthening the Child Nutrition Act, uh, the law that sets nutrition standards for what our kids eat at school. And we propose a historic investment of an additional $10 billion over 10 years to fund that legislation. And with this new investment, we're going to knock down barriers that keep many families from even participating in school meal programs. In that way, we'll add an additional 1 million students in the first five years alone. We're going to dramatically improve the quality of the food we offer in schools, including in school vending machines. We'll take away some of the empty calories and add more fresh fruits and vegetables and other nutritious options. We also plan to double the number of schools in the Healthier U.S. School Challenge. This is an innovative program out of the Department of Agriculture that recognizes schools doing the very best work to keep kids healthy. They're already providing healthy school meals, requiring physical education, incorporating nutrition education into their curriculums. And to help us meet that goal, I am thrilled to announce that for the very first time, several major school food suppliers have come together and committed to decrease sugar, fat, and salt, increase whole grains, and double the fresh produce in the school meals that they serve. That's <laughs> And also for the first time, food service workers, along with principals, superintendents, school board members all across this country are all coming together to support these efforts. And with all of these commitments, we'll be able to reach just about every school child in this country with better information, more nutritious meals, and we'll be able to put them on track to a healthier life. These are major steps, but let's not forget about the rest of the calories our kids consume, the ones they eat outside of school, often at home in their neighborhoods. And when 23.5 million Americans, including 6.5 million children, live in food deserts, and these are communities without a supermarket, these calories are too often empty ones. And you can see the areas uh, here, this beautiful map uh, in dark purple, the food deserts, this is the new USDA food environmental atlas that we're unveiling today. And this atlas maps out everything from diabetes and, uh, diabetes and obesity rates all across the country, uh, as well as food deserts. And you can see them mapped out in, in orange. Uh, this is going to be a very useful tool uh, for parents and for the entire community. So let's move to ensure that all our families have access to healthy, affordable food in their communities. That's the third part of this initiative. Today, for the very first time, we're making a commitment to completely eliminate food deserts in America, and we plan to do that within seven years. Now, we know this is ambitious. That's why it's going to take a serious commitment from both the government and the private sector. So we're going to invest $400 million a year in a healthy food financing initiative that's going to bring grocery stores to underserved areas and help places like convenience stores carry healthier food options. And this initiative won't just help families eat better. It's going to help, as Will Allen said, create jobs and revitalize neighborhoods all across America. But we know that eating right is really only part of the battle. Experts recommend that children get 60 minutes of active play every single day. And if this sounds like a lot, consider this. Kids today spend an average of seven and a half hours a day watching TV, playing on the cell phone, computers, video games, and only a third of high school students get the recommended level of physical activity. So let's move. And I mean literally, let's move. Uh, let's find new ways for kids to be physically active both in and out of schools. And that's the fourth and final part of this initiative. We're going to increase participation in the President's Physical Fitness Challenge, and we'll modernize the challenge so it's not just about how athletic kids are, because not every kid is going to do push-ups and sit-ups, but what's important is how active they are. 
We're going to double the number of kids who earn a Presidential Active Lifestyle Award in the next school year. That award recognizes those students who engage in physical activity five days a week for six weeks. And we've recruited professional athletes from all over the place, a dozen different leagues, including the NFL, Major League Baseball, the WNBA. They've all been terrific. They're going to promote these efforts through sports clinics, public service announcements, and so much more. So that's just some of what we're going to do today to achieve our goal. And we know it won't be easy. We won't get there this year. And we probably won't get there this administration. We know it will take a nationwide movement that continues long after we're gone. That's why today I am so pleased to announce that a new independent foundation has been created to rally and coordinate businesses, nonprofits, state and local governments to keep working until we reach our goal and to measure our progress all along the way. This foundation is called the Partnership for a Healthier America, and it's bringing together some of the leading experts on childhood obesity, like the Robert Wood Jansen Foundation, the California Endowment, the Kellogg Foundation, the Brookings Institution, and the, America, the Alliance for, Healthier, uh, for a Healthier Generation, which is a partnership between the American Heart Association and the Clinton Foundation. And we expect many others to join in the coming months. This is unheard of. So this is a pretty serious effort, one that I'm very proud of, proud of everyone for being a part of it. Uh, and I know that in these challenging times for our country, there will be those who will wonder whether this should really be a priority. There are going to be many who uh, might view things like healthy school lunches and physical fitness challenges as extras, as things we swing, spring for once we've taken care of all the necessities. There are going to be those who ask, how on earth can we spend money on fruits and vegetables in the cafeterias when many schools don't even have books and teachers? Or how can we afford to build parks and sidewalks when we can't even afford our health care costs? But when you step back and think about it, you realize these are false choices. Because if kids aren't getting adequate nutrition, even the best books and teachers in the world won't help them get where we want them to be. And if they don't have safe places to run and play, and they wind up with obesity-related conditions, then those health care costs will just keep rising. So yes, we have to do it all. We're going to need to make modest but critical investments in the short run, but we know that they're going to pay for themselves likely many times over in the long run. Because we won't just be keeping our kids healthy when they're young. We're going to be teaching them habits to keep them healthy their entire lives. And we saw this firsthand with the White House garden when we planted our garden uh, with students like Tammy last year. And one of Tammy's classmates wrote in an essay uh, that her time in the garden, and this is a quote, has made me think about the choices I have with what I put in my mouth. Isn't that good? <laughs> Another wrote with great excitement that he'd learned that tomatoes are both a fruit and a vegetable and contain vitamins that fight diseases. And armed with that knowledge, he declared, so the tomato is a fruit and is now my best friend. <laughs> what more could you want? <laughs> but just think about the ripple effect. When kids use this knowledge to make healthy decisions for the rest of their lives, now think about the effect it's going to have on every aspect of their lives, every bit of it whether they can keep up with their classmates on the playground and stay focused in the classroom, whether they have the self-confidence to pursue the careers of their dreams and then the stamina to succeed in those careers, whether they'll have the energy and the strength to teach their own kids how to throw a ball and ride a bike, and whether they'll live long enough to see their grandkids grow up, maybe even their great-grandkids too. See, in the end, we know that solving our obesity challenge won't be easy, and it certainly won't be quick. But make no mistake about it, this problem can be solved. This isn't like a disease where we're still waiting for the cure to be discovered. We know the cure for this. This isn't like putting a man on the moon or inventing the internet. It doesn't take a stroke of genius or a feat of technology. We have everything we need right now to help our kids lead healthy lives. And rarely in the history of this country 
have we encountered a problem of such magnitude and consequence that is so eminently solvable? So let's move. <laughs> let's move to solve it, because I don't want our kids to live diminished lives because we failed to step up today. I don't want them looking back decades from now and asking us, why didn't you help us when we had the chance? And why didn't you put us first when it mattered the most? So much of what we all want, as Tiki said, for our kids isn't within our control. We want them to succeed at everything they do, everything. We want to protect them from every hardship and spare them from every mistake they'll ever have. But we know we can't do all that. We can't do that. What we can do, what is fully within our control, is to give them the very best start in their journeys. What we can do is give them advantages early in life that will stay with them long after we're gone. As President Franklin Roosevelt once put it, we cannot always build the future for our youth, but we can build our youth for the future. This is our obligation, not just as parents who love our kids, but as citizens who love this country. So let's move. Let's move. Let's get this done. Thank you all so much. Thank you. I look forward to working with you in the years to come. You all take care.